Hello, BookTube. I've got a tag for you today on the Yoga Smart tab. Uh, the M tag from Jim's Books, Reading, and Stuff. Much delayed. I was going to do this on Tuesday. Uh, but I just I just didn't get to it. I was going to do it uh, yesterday, but then it was just too hot. And it's pretty hot today. It's a lot hotter now than it was yesterday. Uh, but I don't want to let this go any longer. Jim is doing a series of tags that take us through the alphabet, and they're fantastic. These... There's a couple of ongoing tags on BookTube that I just love. I think they're great. Uh, long may they rain. Uh, and I didn't want to wait, even though it's mighty hot here in Boston. It's 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Could go up a little higher than that today. No relief in sight. It's going to be uh, 95 or 96 tomorrow. Probably 95 or 90, 90, 92, 93 on Saturday. Then a front comes through. And the temperature drops, at least for a little while. For a couple of days after that, the high, the daytime high, the maximum temperature will be 80 Fahrenheit. We're still going to get summer temperatures, and I imagine we'll get some thunderstorms and whatnot. But, uh, but for the foreseeable future, in the immediate, in the immediate range here, it's very hot here in Boston. Uh, but I didn't want to let this tag wait. I'm using the, uh, the my new piece of tech that I love so much because it has a handle. So I'm not, I can wave it all around without making the screen do anything strange, or I couldn't do it on an iPad. Uh, this is the M tag, all M-related prompts. Uh, M, the first prompt is M is from Manchester. And he, uh, Jim also leaves a long list of other M-related cities, almost all of which I have been to, except Melbourne. I've never been to Melbourne. I've never been to Australia. Uh, what is your favorite book set in a city beginning with M? Uh, I don't mean to, to be a wet blanket. I'm going to be a wet blanket a few times in the course of this tag. This is the least... I love the tag. I love the prompts. But the prompts are the least successful so far in the alphabet tag when it comes to me personally. Uh, I don't... I don't usually give a hoot about the location of where my book is, of where a book is said. I know that this book is referring to a novel. Uh, this prompt is referring to a novel. But even so... Uh, the the my favorite book set in a city it would be like what's your favorite book with a character who has blue eyes it's so it seems so tangential to me that I don't I don't pay attention to it uh, so I'm gonna say Anna Karenina <laughs> I know that's a dumb pat answer but part of Anna Karenina is set in Moscow I, I'll I'll take that I, novels don't get much better than Anna Karenina so I'll say that uh, then M is for murder mystery. Is there a, murder, a better murder mystery than Agatha Christie's? And then there were none. And here Jim is clearly expecting that the answer is going to be no. A big, enthusiastic, universal no. I don't want to disappoint. I don't, I don't want to argue with the master of the ceremonies. But there are plenty of murder mysteries that are better than and then there were none. And then there were none is, is not even one of the best Agatha Christie mysteries. And, and to say nothing of people who actually took mystery writing a little more seriously than she did, in terms of uh, plot, characterization, description of location, uh, description of motivation, I, there are plenty of murder mysteries that, that are better. Catherine Eyre never wrote a murder mystery that wasn't better than And Then There Were None. Marjorie Allingham never wrote a murder mystery that wasn't better than And Then There Were None. Josephine Tay hardly ever failed. Uh, Nagao Marsh hardly ever wrote a murder mystery that, was better, that wasn't better than And Then There Were None. So there are, there are too many to, to mention. Yeah. So it's another example of where the tag prompt sort of gets by me. <laughs> uh, so we'll hope for better. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, M is for magic realism. Not a promising beginning. Uh, what is the first book you read in the genre of magical realism? And that is where the author sets their book in the real world and then fuzzies or muddies or wavers that reality at whim. I've often found it to be uh, a very lazy type of gimmick on the part of authors. Very, very lazy. Uh, not used well at all. I typically don't like it because I want there to be a reason. It doesn't have to be that there's a reason why everything in the story happens. That's one of the ideas that magical realism is specifically designed to combat. But there has to be a reason for the magical realism. It has to make sense. You destroy the DNA of storytelling if anything can happen at any time for any reason. You destroy the DNA if there is no in-continuity believability. If anything can happen at any time. If you introduce a main character, and that main character can be ten characters, can fly when needed to, can shift identity to a different character in the same story when needed to, then you destroyed any call I would have to pay attention. 
because it's not a story anymore. If anything can happen, there's no story. A story is when something happens. Even so, I do have a favorite. I have an example of magical realism that I really like that I thought was done really well. And it's a book I just mentioned the other day. It's Aunt Julia and the Scriptwriter by Mario Vagashosa. Uh, and it's about stories. It's about the way writers actually, by their vocation, are avatars of magical realism because they change reality. And in that sense, and used in that way, it works really well. I, there, there's a lot going on in that novel. I think it would please you immensely. Uh, then uh, the next prompt also goes right. This is, the M had the M tag has had less Steve traction than any alphabet tag so far. The next one is M is for maps. What is your favorite map? Who has a favorite map? <laughs> I'm sure that plenty of people do, but I don't. I don't even know how I'd go about having a favorite map. What, what would determine what would be a favorite map as opposed to a, a less than favorite map? I don't know even how I would that would work. So I, I don't have a favorite. We're just going to pass on. Uh, the next prompt is M is for Mississippi. Uh, what is your favorite story set on the Mississippi? I'd be very curious to know, as this tag makes the round, how many of you have actually seen the Mississippi? How many of you have been to the Mississippi? I have been to the Mississippi. I've lived on the Mississippi. I've lived in a state that is on the Mississippi. I've swam in the Mississippi, waded in the Mississippi. I've been well, with my dogs, where well, well, we all waded and swam in the Mississippi. I've been on the Mississippi 80 million times, the whole length of the thing. I, and it, uh, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. It's a river steeped in American history. And needless to say, it's also steeped in American literature. Jim points this out in the tag that he does. I'll leave a link to his tag down below. Uh, so there are all sorts of predictable answers that you could give to this. I have a slightly less predictable answer. Uh, his own answer was uh, unpredictable to me. He, he said Fever Dream by George R.R. R. Martin, a really terrific historical vampire story from back in the days when George R.R. R. Martin could be edited. Uh, I also have a slightly, a slightly unconventional pick here, uh, despite all, not, not a knock on all the great literature that's been done that circulates around the Mississippi, but I'm going to say Showboat by Edna Ferber, who had a, recently had a great, a very beautiful reissue of a lot of her work. I forget who did that reissue, but if you look her up on Amazon, you're going to see some dazzling new reissues of her work. I'm pretty sure that was recent enough so that those will still be in print. But I don't know how much good that's going to do. I, Showboat was written a century ago, and it really shows. And so does, I, I believe, everything else that Edna Ferber wrote. You really have to get into the, the diction, the mind frame. She's very much a writer of her time. I don't know that you could give her the prettiest revamp in the world, and it would, it would help with the readability of her books for a 21st century audience. Uh, but Showboat came to my mind not only because it's set on the Mississippi, but because it mo a large chunk of it is set on the Mississippi. It takes A large chunk of it takes place on the water of the Mississippi, not even moving to land. Just a group of performers on a ship, on a vessel, on the Mississippi. So that it, it came to my mind. And Showboat may have been one of that reissue. I should look into that. Uh, when that reissue was made, I enthused about it to a publicist. And she said, well, with reissues, they, they're not, you know, our, our team isn't always keen. On, they know they're not going to get a write-up. So they're not always keen on sending out copies. So I might not be able to do it. And I, she never did. I never did get copies of those. But I, they were pretty enough so that I might be willing to buy those uh, just to have Edna Ferber here. And I, I can't remember if Showboat was one of the things they, she wrote a lot. So they didn't reissue everything. But I think it might have been one of the ones that they reissued. I'll have to check and see on that. But I'm going to say Showboat. Uh, by Edna Ferber. Uh, then the, the next prompt, another one that goes right by me, no Steve Traction at all. M is for Muslim. What is the last book you read with a Muslim protagonist? It's not the sort of thing that I would ever notice, that I would ever care about, unless it was really, really prominent in the story. Uh, in which case that would be uh, probably a fairly bad story. Uh, and then it occurred to me that you, even though I wasn't paying attention, there is an example. And I looked it up just to make sure, and it's true. It, we saw it on this channel. It's the tale of Princess Fatima, one of the new additions to the Penguin Classic lineup. Uh, and Princess Fatima is a Muslim, so there you go. <laughs> That'll work. Um, then the next prompt is M is for Mars. What is your favorite book about Mars or Mar about Martians? And I, I know I'm, I'm being unfair to Jim here, when he, but I'm assuming that when he adds in or about Martians, he means w that the book should be fiction. There are a huge number of books on, of nonfiction on Mars, especially since 
we've had some great advances in our knowledge of Mars. Uh, but even if he didn't intend that, I'm going to stick with fiction. And the, the curious thing about, of course, Mars has been a staple of science fiction forever. Since long before we even had good photography of Mars, much less probes or any kind, anything like that. The Barsoom novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs are some of my favorite things to read and reread. But I noticed when I was thinking about my answer to this prompt, how many books about Mars I have really enjoyed, even though they are written by science fiction authors I don't particularly like. It's like something about the subject really does it for them. Oh. Oh. It's my own little marsh. Hey, baby. What you doing? Oh, aren't you pretty? Oh. <laughs> M is from My Little Bean. <laughs> oh, hey, baby. <laughs> Uh, I picked up a couple of examples of that, because you want to say The Martian Chronicles, but I like Ray Bradbury. Anyway, but I was thinking of, I wrote down here The Forge of God uh, by Greg Bear, which is uh, far and away, I mean, w wildly the, my favorite Greg Bear novel. And this is a science fiction author who's been much lauded, has, I guess, lots of fans. I've hardly ever liked anything that I've read by him. But the, sand, the Forge of God, I loved. I thought it was terrific. And the same thing with The Sands of Mars by Arthur C. Clarke. I'm not a big Arthur C. Clarke fan. I think he was a, kind of a boring writer. Uh, tends to get a lot of his science more or less correct for his time. Uh, but I, as far as narrative goes, I, I just, I'm never involved in any of his narrative. Whereas his, you know, his co-evil, Isaac Asimov, often gets science wrong. But his writing is at least involving. You're never bored in an Isaac Asimov story, whereas in Arthur C. Clarke, I often am bored. It's cardboard. Uh, but Sands of Mars, I didn't think so. Sands of Mars, I thought, really worked. Don't have a copy of it. I looked. I once had a paperback copy of Sands of Mars and Forge of God. I don't have a copy of either one of them now. But I can strongly recommend both of them, uh, even though they're not authors that I typically recommend. Uh, and the next prompt is, uh, M is for must read. What is a book you feel you must read? I have two answers to this. One involves my vocation and my, my passion, which is American market new releases in the 15 or 16 genres that I regularly read. I must read the, the major new releases that fall under that umbrella. I don't have to. For my job, I have to read quite a few of them, but I don't have to read them all. I don't have to read anywhere near as many as I do, but I, I feel like I must. I love that. I fell into that habit 15 years ago and I'm sticking with it. I love the feeling when the year is over that I did at least a kind of justice to the publishing year that just was, as opposed to the feeling that so many bookish people I have known over my life have had at the end of every year, where they look back and think, I barely read any of the books I wanted to this year. And as far as the new releases, if the friend is a publisher or a publicist or a writer or a reviewer, they will start, they used to start the year thinking, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit all the biggies, and they don't. It's years until they get they get around to Mason and Dixon or whatever. I love the feeling of thinking that I have acquitted myself well in though in that category of must read. But there's another category of must read that I think is a lot closer to the sentiments on BookTube, and that is something that connects with what I've often talked about on this channel, the Bank of Steve, where uh, an an author really pleases me with a book, where I just love it, and then. slurping in my videos uh, and then maybe they write another one and they really please me they hit it out of the park again and then another one and they do and they're never drawing on their account at the bank of Steve instead they're only depositing into it when an author gets to a point where their account at the bank of Steve is just sky high they are a must read author for me if they write something I want to get to it right away for the, sh the, the very simple human reason of that I'm, I'm odds on sure I'm going to love it Bean what are you doing what are you doing? What's so interesting that you're licking there? Oh, now you're licking me. Oh, she's got the lickies. <laughs> now you're licking me. They don't care about my answers to the tags. They just want to see more of you. <laughs> I'm almost done, baby. You want to get down? Is that why you're staring at this? Do you want to come down? No? Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm almost done. Just hang on a second here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Okay, so those are my two answers to must read. One is professional, and then one is the Bank of Steve. Then uh, the next prompt is M is for Margaret. What is your favorite book by Margaret Atwood? Talk about lack of traction. 
that Margaret Atwood is one of my bet noirs. She's not quite Alice Munro, but she'll do. Uh, she is, in my opinion, almost completely talentless. And also, on top of that, to add insult to injury, a carpetbagger. Someone who's decided, well, there's a there's one of these these weird little easy to please genres out there, the science fiction, I think it's called. I can write that, and you know, I if I if I put sentences to, sentences together better than some of their hack writers, well, then I'll be a luminary in that in that little colonial genre. I, I, I a little part of me dies every time I see a speaking program or an anthology in which Margaret Atwood is described as a great science fiction writer. A little part of me dies every time that happens. Uh, she doesn't do anything that science fiction is supposed to do, and she doesn't write all that well. Uh, I've read everything major that she's written, and talk about a low account of The Bank of Steve. I don't have a favorite book by Mara Atwood. I've scarcely liked any of them. The one thing I kind of sort of liked was her entry in the Hogarth Shakespeare series that I thought worked fairly well, but only because most of the work of writing and plotting was done for her. <sighs> so let's just move on. This is an, this is an unsuccessful barrage of questions, but, but uh, the, the tag's heart is in the right place. The final tag, uh, the final prompt is Mar M is for Margaret Pinard, our fellow booktuber, Margaret Pinard. Have you read any of Margaret Pinard's books? And, and true to keeping with, this, with the style of this tag, I have not. <laughs> Margaret Pinard is an author. Uh, she has a great booktube channel, uh, but I've never read any of her books. So, so the tags for the M tag have managed to all but completely fail to engage me. <laughs> so maybe you will have better luck. As usual with tags, I tag anyone who wants to do this. This series is great. If you haven't done the previous alphabet tags, go all the way back to A and start catching up. There are, these are great prompts. They're totally fun prompts. Uh, despite my lack of, of success with this one. I'm sure I'll do better with the N tag. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up. I'll see you then. Thank you, book two.